before we go any further, um, I just want to tell you that today's topic is deep, and it could even be triggering for some of you. Um, and that's just a warning. Um, we are going to be talking about, I'll, I'll put the uh, question up on the screen here. Um, here's what God asks. What about church abuse? And how should the church handle people who abuse others in the church? So how about a lighthearted topic today? Like I said, these are the kinds of things that when you guys ask, I'm so thankful because if I'm honest, I don't think I would have preached something like this. But it's forced me to put together a good study to where we can understand some balance on a topic like this. But man, if you've been through something very difficult in your past and you think this might be triggering for you, I'm going to give you the warning now because you might just not be up to this topic today. And I just want to acknowledge that. You might want to like slowly in the next couple minutes just pretend that you're going to get coffee and not come back. Can I get an amen? Sometimes the topics have that nature to them. So um, we're a church that loves each other and we understand each other and it's okay to not be okay. Amen? It's okay to not be okay. Um, I'm going to start today with the worst aspect of this problem of church abuse. I'm going to go into the darkness so that we can understand where the light is together. And one of the dark things about this topic is that the church too often has swept things under the rug. The church too often, in order to protect its name and its reputation and its brand, we have tried to control the narrative of abominable things, right? So we're going to drive into this. In 2019, the Houston Chronicle came out with an article about the Southern Baptist Convention and churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. Some of you are familiar with this. They said that 400 Southern Baptist church leaders and volunteers had sexual misconduct allegations against them. In the last 20 years, there had been 700 victims, some as young as three years old, that had been sexually abused, some raped, some of them molested repeatedly. Are we serious now? J.D. Greer, former president of the SBC, said this in response to the article because they had done also a widespread investigation and found that much of this was true. He said, the abuses described in this Houston Chronicle article are pure evil. The voices in this article should be heard as a warning sent from God calling the church to repent. As Christians, we are called to expose everything sinful to the light. The survivors in this article have done that at a personal cost that few of us can fathom. We must admit that our failures as churches and as pastors put these survivors in a position where they were forced to stand alone and speak when we should have been fighting for them. It's a big deal. The next one I'll, I'll talk to you about, this one happened in the Catholic Church worldwide. Some of you saw the movie Spotlight. This won some Academy Awards. It was a really important movie. came out several years ago. And it looked at the Boston Globe and how an investigative group there uh, looked into the Boston diocese um, and abuses that were happening with priests there. Some horrifying stuff. According to a 2004 research study, and I'm giving you the exact names here because it's important, by the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, they found this nationwide, so going beyond Boston, 4,392 Catholic priests and deacons in active ministry, 1950 to 2002, have been plausibly accused of underage sexual abuse. And those accusations represent 10,667 individuals that were abused. Pope Francis said in response to this, the church's credibility has been seriously undercut and diminished by these sins and crimes, but even more by the efforts made to deny or conceal them. This has led to a growing sense of uncertainty, distrust, and vulnerability among the faithful. So can we put our question back up? What about church abuse and how should the church handle abusers? Do you see why this person asked this question? This is a big deal. And the reason I began us with two very extreme cases, pervasive cases, cases that go across so many years, is because 
I don't want there to be any kind of hint from me to you that this is a small problem. I don't want to make any kind of hint to you that we can feel okay in our kind of church tradition because this is predominantly happening in some other kind of church tradition or denomination. The only thing we can really attach these problems to are sinful human beings in need of God's grace. And as long as churches are full of sinful, broken human beings in need of God's grace, we are going to struggle with this issue. It's worth asking about. Amen? So here's where we're going to start. In the word, John 21, verses 15 through 17. There's a critical point that's going to come out of this that we all need to begin with. Because this forms the basis of our response. By the way, there are no jokes being told today. Can I just tell you that? This is a really deep, serious topic. And I don't plan to disrespect it by making light of anything here today. Okay, so John 21, um, and the scene here, let me give you the scene, because this is a core, core scripture for us today. The scene is, is that Jesus is on the seashore, and he's with Peter and the other disciples. And the reason he's there is because he's restoring Peter. Jesus has already died on the cross. He's risen from the grave, and Jesus is here with Peter to restore him, because Peter did what? Peter denied Jesus how many times? Three times he denied Jesus. And Jesus goes to restore him into ministry. And Jesus is about to restore him three times. You're going to see this here. Verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Verse 16, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Here's what Jesus didn't say. Jesus did not say, then go start a movement. Jesus did not say, go build a brand and a beautiful building. Jesus did not say, go write enough books to get enough royalties coming in to where no one can know what you're actually getting paid. He didn't say any of that. He said, feed my sheep. He said, take care of my lambs. He said, you've got to teach them and you've got to protect them. That's your job. And the other piece that I want to pull out here, because it's so, such a cornerstone on this topic, is Jesus said, they're my sheep. They're not yours. I'm actually going to give you a slide that is uh, way too in-depth for us today, but oh well. Um, this is actually from the Greek study tool that I use. It's called a uh, New Testament interlinear Greek um, tool. And I want you to see that phrase there actually spelled out in the original Greek. Jesus actually says, feed lambs my. Why am I showing you that? Because I want you to know that the translators did not add the word my there just in order to make the sentence comprehensible. Jesus actually took a moment all three times with Peter and said, they're mine. The sheep are mine. They're not your sheep, Peter. They're my sheep. That matters. Every single pastor needs to be reminded that the people in the church are not there for us. They are not there for my pay. They are not there for my ego. They are not there for my legacy. And the reason I say this is because Many of these things that we're talking about today that are so deep and so they're rattling to us. How could a pastor get to a place? How could a priest get to a place where they're treating someone like this? I would say to you, it is easier to use someone when you have spent your ministry life, years of your ministry life, believing that those people have been there for you all along. You are not here for me. 
you belong to Jesus. If by God's grace, I am called to this ministry in order to help take care of you, I am only a steward of his people. You are not here for me. You don't belong to me. The sheep aren't yours, pastor. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Next, let's look at the qualifications. You keeping up? You doing okay? All right, next. So we got a, a, a passage here. It's a long passage, but I think you need to see it because this passage is going to describe to us the qualifications for an elder. And I'm reading it to you because I want you to see what the job description is. And I want you to just see what the Bible says people should be like if they take the role of an elder or a pastor. Titus 1.6 says, An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home and he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message that he was taught. And then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. It's a long passage, isn't it? It's a lot that gets described there. Let me summarize the big points for you. A pastor or elder needs to have an established life of integrity. They need to be trustworthy. They need to be faithful in their marriage and their kids need to be spiritually stable. They need to have very little ego as a person. It can't all be about them. Amen. They need to not have an anger problem or an addiction problem. They need to be very honest with money, wise and fair, devoted to Jesus, and actually believe what the Bible says for themselves personally. Well, that's a lot. Um, feels kind of impossible. Does it feel kind of impossible to anybody else? It should. Um, it should get you quaking in your boots just a little bit. Here's, here's what I would say to modify it just a little bit. I believe this list represents what I would call established character. That we're looking for our church leaders to have established character and not perfection. And I say not perfection because if that was the heart of this passage, no one would ever be a pastor. Can I get a better amen? No one would ever do it because we're all going to fail at that list. But at the same time, there is the possibility to have established character. You're like, well, how is that even possible? Well, here's how it's possible. If you start to walk with Jesus and you start to read his word and he saves your soul and you see yourself as having no rights at all in this world, because guess what? You earned hell day one. And if he radically saved you and then you get called to serve his people, man, you want to pour into his word and you want to try out his commands and you want to live according to the life and the way and the path of Jesus because you want to prove these things in your own life and in your own family and as you walk that path so that you're not a hypocrite and telling other people to do things that you're not doing at all if you actually start to walk that path you get shocked because you start seeing healing come into your relationships As you walk the path of Jesus Christ, you start to see eternal power flow into your life because it's all true. And once you start to realize that it's all true and it all starts to change me, you start to trust it and you start to do it more and you get a hunger for more and more and more of it. And then Jesus says, hey, be a pastor. Why don't you lead other people to trust the same thing? And when you do that, you're not going to do it with perfection. But when you fail, it's going to break your heart. Why is it going to break your heart? Because at the end of the day, you actually care what Jesus thinks. Because at the end of the day, it's not been about following a law. It's been about pleasing a Savior and loving him. And when you have those moments where you realize you fell short, it breaks your heart. 
And it breaks your heart not only because of what you've done to him, but it breaks your heart because of how that might impact other people around you. And so what you do is you run to other trusted leaders that are around you and say, let me pour out my heart to you. I failed. And you trust them and you invite trusted people in to know about your life and you don't keep your sin leaders in a dark corner. Why? Because you're only as sick as your secrets. And you don't keep your sin in a dark corner because that's where it grows. You bring it out into the light where it dies. But I don't mean you're going to go and broadcast it to a, you know, coliseum. You're going to tell it to a few trusted people who know how to walk with you through that to rebuke you well, to encourage you to maybe change your lifestyle to where you aren't tempted in the same way, to where you can have better victory. They're going to speak wisdom into your life. And you're going to allow them to come in and do that. Why? Because Jesus matters. It's not about perfection. It's about us, an established pattern of character. And one of the ways that you know that your pastor or your leader has that established pattern of, of character is because when things start to go wrong, they're not going to sweep it under the rug. Why? Because these aren't my sheep. And keeping things in a dark corner is not what, what's worked for me in the past. So I'm going to run to truth and I'm going to run to accountability. And that's the kind of stuff that you should see from your pastors. Running to accountability in the small things and in the medium things before we ever get to the big things. I talked too long on that point. Linda and I had an old pastor. His name was Pastor Mike. And he's in a different state and he's not in ministry anymore. Um, Mike, wonderful guy. Very, very good at a lot of what he did in the pastorate. It came out that he had been having an affair for two years. Extramarital affair. Had kids at home. It was brutal. The church had him get up in the pulpit and share with everybody what he had been doing for two years. And through tears and through shame, he said all of this stuff to us. That was not a healthy approach, by the way. But they were trying to make it public, and I appreciate that they were trying to make it public. I, it just turned ugly. And then the leadership put him back in the pulpit the very next week to preach. And they said, well, we got to forgive and Linda and I struggled with that. And we were very, very young, and we didn't know all this scripture yet. So we went to counselors in our life, and we asked them advice, people that we trusted. And the more that, that we talked to other people who are wiser than us, they pointed us to these scriptures, and they showed us the qualifications in scripture, and they said, that established pattern of character, that's not just at the beginning when you choose elders, it's when you confirm elders, it's when you confirm pastors back and you have to ask yourself the question, do they have that established pattern again? After two years, can they have it again that quickly? No. And he didn't need further shaming. He needed restoration. Which is its own grace, by the way. He needed counseling with his spouse. He needed counseling with his wife. He needed to go deep and, and ask some deep questions about what about two years of ignoring the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life and still preaching? And how are you putting all that together? Because something was wrong. And like, let's dive into those things and let's correct those things and let's rebuild you. Hard questions to ask. So maybe you're thinking at this point in the message, why does God use humans at all in the church? Because isn't this a big colossal mess? It's a really good question. I think a simple answer for that goes back to his grace. That he intends the church to be like a broken vessel. Like a broken clay pot that there's a treasure inside of. So that nobody will bring glory to people. They'll realize that the glory is only with Jesus. Ever. I think his grace is part of that. I grieve the fact that in 2,000 years of church history. 
I feel like it's riddled with countless moments where we have not earned the trust that Jesus gave us, if I'm being real. The other answer, I think, is that human church leaders are the way simply that he chose to do this, and I got to trust him. So one of my spiritual gifts is I sometimes overanalyze things to death. Yes. And this next section might be that. I'm going to risk the overkill because I think that there might be something here for us. So I want to look at something I'm calling the trust path of the believer. Uh, The trust path that all of us walk through. Because I think you might see yourself in this. Uh, Number one, the way that we begin trusting as a brand new believer or, and maybe even before we believe in Jesus or believe in the gospel, is we start in this place where we start to trust a leader's words. Like we come before Billy Graham, for instance, and we're like, he just said something that sounded smart or wise or helpful. I, I may not trust Billy Graham, but he said a good thing there. And that's where we begin. And God uses that human being as a baby step for us to begin ultimately to trust him. But we've got to start somewhere. And so God gives us people who speak with human lips that we can hear and understand. And we start by trusting a leader's words. But the next stage is that we trust the leader themselves. Right? We get to a spot where Billy Graham says so many smart things so many times in a row that we're like, okay, even when he says something that I don't like, he's probably right. Because he's been so trustworthy in the past. And maybe I need to let my arm be twisted by this guy just a little bit. And we find ourselves trusting the leader ultimately. Yes? Third step. Third step is that we trust Jesus in the leader. And that's a better step. And that's where we need to start moving. Is that we start to realize that Billy Graham has good days and he has bad days. Now he has more good days than me. Amen. But he has good days and bad days. And what I start to realize is that sometimes when he makes mistakes, what happens is that he didn't let Jesus take the wheel that day. Amen. Like he took control and he was having a bad day. And on those days, I need to trust Jesus in the leader. I need to realize that the times that things are going good with him, it's because Jesus was showing up and he was letting Jesus show up. But I start to not see Billy as much anymore. I start to realize it's Jesus that's important in my leader. And then I get to step four where I just trust Jesus alone. Some of you guys are at the stage where you're like, well, I got Billy Graham and I got maybe five or six other leaders that no matter what they write or whatever they preach, it's always just good and I always just trust them. And some of you guys like me, you're done with those lists. I got some people that I trust more than other people, but I've been disillusioned on just about everybody. And I don't mean that in a dark way. Please don't take me wrong. I don't mean I've been disillusioned and I'm disillusioned with the church or disillusioned with Jesus. I'm not disillusioned with people. And I think that there's grace in that. I think at the end of being disillusioned with humanity, we start find ourselves grasping for Jesus. And I think that's the point. I think the point is that you would grasp for Jesus. And some of us are holding on to human leaders too much. And it's not safe, and it's not good. Do you see that? Maybe you've been in this spot, or maybe you know somebody who's been in this spot, and you were in a church, and things were going great, and all of a sudden, the leader had a failure. And then you saw all these people in the church left the church because the leader had had a failure. What spot were they in? They were in the first two. Yes, They had all of their trust trained on a person. And it wasn't wasn't a safe foundation for them. 
And I think we've all had that experience and we all grieve that experience. But what it should wake us up to is that we need to be moving down through that list. And as church leaders, we need to get really clear with all of you. The point here of this whole thing is that you would come to a place where you trust Jesus Christ alone and not me. And so anything that we do in the church that's promoting a human leader and that's promoting a human brand and trying to protect that reputation, it, I don't think it's what God's about. I think we need, constantly need to be reminding you, you're here for Jesus. You aren't my sheep. You're his. Mine, 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 mine. Hear Jesus say it. Mine, 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 mine. They're my sheep. <sighs> part of the reason that we can't point to a human being and part of the reason you can only trust Jesus is there isn't a human being here that died for you. that laid down his life for you, that followed in the perfect will of the Father, that just seemed to, in every single situation, loved people more than he loved himself. Nobody rises to that standard outside of Jesus. And not only is he worthy, but he has a right to your worship in a way that I don't. It can't be about human beings. Okay, so how do we handle church abusers? Another lighthearted topic. That was the second part of this question. 1 Timothy 5.20. Everybody doing okay? So what? It's heavy. All right, 1 first, first Timothy 5.20. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. And I tried to read that with a smile on my face. <laughs> Three really big phrases there. People, number one, this is people who persist in sin. This is this established pattern of sin in their life. This is not somebody that is imperfect that had a one moment failure. Now, there are one moment failures that are so destructive, we still have to bring public rebuke. Don't get me wrong. But the persist in sin part is trying to point us to something deeper. So this is not licensed to go and pick on pastors for not being perfect people. Second phrase, rebuke them in the presence of all. Make it public. Make it public in a healthy way. I don't agree with what they did with Pastor Mike and asking him to stand up there and pour out his guts through tears in front of everybody in a totally shameful way. I don't think that that was helpful. But at the same time, I think there are churches that are like, let's take this fallen pastor, bring them in a room where nobody else knows about anything. And this pastor can go on to hurt other people. And I don't think that's right. And I think the second phrase, rebuke them in the presence of all, rebuke them publicly. This should be made known in a healthy way. I think there needs to be a balance of the purity of Jesus Christ as he purifies his church. That's justice. It's goodness. And then it needs to be balanced with grace. We need to figure out how to balance that with grace as we do that. And then third, so that the rest may stand in fear and that's not a phrase we talk about very often, standing in fear as Christians. Because again, we're, we're so often talking about God's grace and the joy that we get and the security that we get from, from, from God's grace. But there are moments in the New Testament where warnings are given to leaders. In the book of James, teachers are warned that do you realize you'll be judged more harshly? Don't just think it's some easygoing thing to be a pastor and to be a Bible teacher. It's like there's responsibility for this and there will be accountability for leaders. And when it says there that there will be 
fear. There will be something that will be woven into the church culture where you are. I just want you to think about that for a second. What will be woven in? What will be woven in if we would do this right is that there are lines that cannot be crossed. There are lines that cannot be crossed. And when those lines are crossed, there will be consequences for it. And we should all know that. Heavy. And there may be times where a line that was crossed, where a pastor needs to go find themselves a different career. Because for them to go and do a restorative process, it may be at the magnitude of years for that restoration process to take place. And they may need to step aside and let others lead during that time. But can I just say, I see the grace of Jesus in every single one of those. Because even, even for a pastor who's starting to use other people and they're starting to protect their title, taking them out of that title and bringing that level of rebuke and not allowing them to function in that role anymore. I just want you to think about it for a second. One of the things that I think can go wrong with us, and I'm speaking as a pastor, is I think sometimes we can get confused about who we are and what our identity is. And the thing is, at the end of the day, I'm not a pastor. You might call me that, but at the end of the day, I'm a child of God. At the end of the day, I, I, I'm a loved, saved son of God. And that's who I am. And that's what matters. And what have I done with this? <laughs> it's just like pulling me backward. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think in our own dysfunction as pastors we can start to get confused way back here about who we really are before God. And the reason we get so protective of our title is because we're under the deception that that is who we are. And sometimes God in his grace, the only way he can break us free is to take us out. And the grace of God as he takes us out is that our identity can be restored to a safe and healthy place. I'm way in the deep end of the pool here. We all right? I think there's grace in all that. Okay, so what should we do in a case of abuse in a church like Grace Fellowship? And do not try to take notes on this next section because this is going to drive you crazy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through several of these steps, and the purpose of it is I want you to understand that there would be teeth in a process here balanced with grace. I pray balanced with grace. But step one, if abuse is claimed, a thorough and objective investigation into the abuse should be done for sure. The accused leader should have no influence on the investigation. It should be fairness and honesty and love, paramount. Number two, Immediate protection should be offered to the victim of abuse and possibly temporary removal of the accused during that investigation just so that the image of that investigation could be right and trusted. Number three, the victim should be consulted for their full account and help should be offered them in all ways for healing for what they've gone through. Number four, where it's helpful or required by law, the authorities should be notified of the abuse. The reason for this is in the book of Romans, it talks about the fact that we are supposed to submit ourselves to the governing authorities and the church should be first in line with this, folks. And if they say this should be reported to the authorities, we should yield to that. And there is grace even in that because there are people, and you see it in the SBC and you see it in the Catholic story, there are people who will leave one congregation and they will take advantage of the silence and they will move to another congregation and they will victimize other people by notifying the authorities and taking it to a more public way, we stop that. We have the ability to stop that. Next, a high priority cannot be placed on the reputation of the church leader. And that's a tough one. I'm not saying that there's no grace. I'm just saying that that cannot be considered the highest priority in the decisions for how a church walks through a crisis like this. 
Number six, high priority cannot be placed on protecting the reputation of the church either. People will come along and they will say very dysfunctional things like, we can't let this get out. We have to control this narrative because if we don't, people won't get saved. And as soon as you go to that kind of logic, folks, you will give yourself license for terrible things. You can't do that. There are times, and and I don't have a verse for this, but I'll just say it. There are times that I believe that God allows a battle to be lost for the sake of the broader war. And the bigger picture is that Jesus would be glorified and that Jesus would be seen as the great shepherd. Next, if a church leader is found guilty of abuse, they should be publicly rebuked and in many cases removed from their role for the purpose of protecting God's people. And then right after that, number eight, appropriate grace must be offered to that same fallen leader and a path of restoration and it should be financially provided for by the church, should be offered to that leader, the rebuilding of the marriage, the rebuilding of the family, the rebuilding of their identity, the rebuilding of their character, not shamed and canceled and crushed. Verse, or number nine, Jesus must be glorified in the church. He must be glorified for his love and his purifying work in the church and in the abuser. His healing and his heart for protection over the victim and his justice and his longing for his church to walk in unselfish love. It is his church. It is not ours. Okay. Can I share something positive with you? There's a story. Gosh, all of this is so dark. And I was like, Jesus, you got to show me the picture of a good pastor. You got to show me the picture of a pastor who actually got this. And shockingly, he took me to King David. And I want to show it to you. And King David, if you studied him before, you know he's a mixed bag. Amen? Because on the one hand, you got King David, who's like this pastor, this man after God's own heart. But in the, same, in, the, in the next same breath, he's like, you know, committing adultery and murdering people. He's a mess, and we, and we struggle with the paradox of pastors, don't we? And we see it in David, that paradox. So there's this moment that happens. And some of you might know the story, but David calls for a census of God's people. He wants them to be counted. He wants to know how mega his mega church is. He wants to know how many soldiers are in the army so he can feel nice and secure and big and strong and all these things in his humanity. And God sees it for what it is. He sees the ego trip that David's trying to be on. And so God comes in and he brings judgment against this leader. And it's rough because the way it goes down in the scripture is that this this angel who brings destruction brings it against the people. And you might look at that, and I I looked at it that way. I I, I read through that, and I'm like, God, why, why does the pain come to the people when it's the leader who did the thing? And it's tough. But isn't that a parable of often what happens in the church? And so that's what's going on and people are getting hurt and David sees it. In 2 Samuel 24, 17, he has a moment of clarity. It says, when David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but the sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and on my family. You love the language that he uses there. It's like he finally wakes up to it. These aren't my sheep. I'm the shepherd. They didn't do the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. I was the person who was supposed to take care of them. Why in the world would I let this go on this way? And he stops and he holds himself up to God and says, bring it to me. How many of these stories would be different 
if our pastors said, God, let it fall on me instead of your people? Don't we want that? In that moment in the story, God stops the judgment and there's consequences for the people, or for David, I'm sorry, there's consequences for David, but the people are saved. And that's how it's supposed to be in the church. Pastors need to do the right thing. Father in heaven, we need you to give us leaders who will lay down their lives for the sheep. Give us leaders who will lay down their reputations and their paychecks and their book sales and their platforms. And they will yield their place and they will find new careers when it's necessary. Amen. Father, give us leaders who will care for and protect your people and who will work hard to direct the focus of everybody onto Jesus where it belongs, not onto us. Father, give us those leaders. Jesus said in John 10, said, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And that's what we should do. Amen. I want you guys to stand. Just to close this out, I, I was mindful in this message, preparing for it, just the number of people that would be in a, a, a congregation like today and just the, the grace that we all need in this. We all need God's grace, amen? And, and there are people in this congregation today that have been the victims in church crises in the past. And the church did not handle the situation right. And they went into self-protection mode. And they went into control mode. And they protected them instead of protecting you. They tried to heal them instead of healing you. And where does that leave you? It, it's, it's a miracle that you're here in church today. Can I say that? Thank God you're here in church today. It should have never been done. I hope you see that in the word. I don't know how you, you, I don't know how you have a verse in your Bible that says, rebuke them publicly so that others may fear and you thought it was okay to sweep it under a rug. I don't know how you do that. And for some of you, it was done to you. And I just need to say the words to you. It was wrong. It was wrong. Jesus wants healing for you. It was not his will. Some of you are here and you're disillusioned today and your heart's been broken by the church in the past because you saw these things go down. You saw bad situations and you walked away from bad situations and you've never quite put it together before and God's got to clean some stuff up in your heart to help you trust again. I would just say to you, that your trust is not, it's not about restoring your trust in people. It's about restoring your trust in Jesus because that's the safe path. And some of you may even be here today and you were a leader before and you fell and you were dealt with harshly and you were canceled and you were crushed and while you might look back on that and say, I deserved, the truth is there should have been grace because we all want grace. We all need grace. What would we do without grace? And we need to pray for your healing as well. Amen? Can we pray? Let's pray. Jesus, for all those here today, Lord, regardless, God, of where we're at, I pray for a miraculous healing of Jesus Christ down deep into the deep place, God, that we don't talk about very much, God. This kind of a topic today, Lord, it, it shocks us because it's, it's hard, it's messy, God, it's complex, God, but we're thankful, Lord, today that we see answers in your word and we see you speaking about these things in your word. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you didn't stay silent.
But Jesus, I pray for healing. I pray for surrender that we would let go. I pray, Lord, for the church that we would do better. That we would do better at pointing people to Jesus. We would do better at walking through these kinds of moments when they happen, God, in a Jesus-honoring way. Help us to find your grace, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.